an odyssey beyond the Himalayas. Life in Nappadol Park. The philosophy of Buddhism states that the existence of reality is in a constant and inevitable change. Yet, the high barren mountains and massive snow-capped Himalayas all around the landscape seems to stand still. So does the culture and lifestyle of people here in 4,000 meter in the Himalayan desert. It seems as if passing through a portal to an ancient civilization where the passage of time has stopped for hundreds of years. Yet, my journey and experience here in Apadulpa have been flowing like the Mukukarnali that has been shaping this mighty rocks for time unknown. Just as the geography and climate, life here is harsh and tough. Despite all that, the people are as warm as the pleasant sun and innocent as the moon. With no electricity, roads and modern infrastructure, life here is basic as it can get. There are no shops, hotels or any sign of financial infrastructure. One still practices barter system and communal support to build home. Transhuman pastoralism and high altitude crop cultivation is practiced seasonally to support livelihood. Yaks, mountain horses, Donkeys are used as means of transport of people and goods from one village to another. And that is how we got here along with our goods and packages after two flights from Kathmandu to Nepalgans and then to Chufal Airport and seven days of trekking and horse riding over 5100 meter high passes over the Himalayas to Upper Dulpa land of snow leopard. On day one, we flew from Kathmandu to Nepalgans on the peak of COVID-19 crisis. After night in Nepalgans, we took our first flight to Jufal Airport on a small twin hour plane which was almost like a microbus. However, the flight was smooth with clear skies and first glimpses of snow-covered Himalayas on the way. That day, we stayed in Dunai, which is an hour drive from Tufal. From the next day, we got stuck in Dunai for a week, with the news about heavy snow on the high passes. However, during our stay in Dunai, we took every opportunity to go around and visit new places of Lower Dolpa. The landscape had already awed us on our short hikes in Dunai and a road trip to Tripura Sundari. After a long hangout in Lower Dolpa, we finally made our way to our Upper Dolpa. On the ninth day, we finally left Dunai and headed to Lassikap. The trek took almost 8 hours. From Lassikap, there were only 10 houses. However, the journey was filled with meeting new people, refreshing talks, and tea times and of course 
some good dal bhat on the way. <laughs> Warm fireplace to hang out with other travelers in the evening. We also came across beautiful rivers, steep rocky pathways, and of course, some amazing views, which I always took time to play something on my harmonica. After trekking across mountains, rivers, we finally made it to Dhotarab Valley, where we got a first glimpse of Upper Delta. It is the same village where the movie Caravan was captured. We left Dhotarap on horseback to cross the mighty Jangla Pass at 5100 meters above sea level. The ride was very steep and breathtaking. There were times when we felt we should have trekked the climb instead of riding horses. After four hours of climbing and dragging the horses through deep snow, the moment at top of Jangla Pass was a sight. The dark blue sky, glittering snow-covered mountains, glaciers, and the clusters of Tahulargiri peaks in the east brought warm tears to my cold frozen cheeks. On the way, we crossed snow-covered mountains, deserted landscapes, steep downhills, ancient monasteries, and villages like Namdo, Saldang, and Tiling and the beautiful and transparent Mugu Karnali, where one could see the stones even in its deepest pockets. After clearing our thirsts along with the horses from this splendid blue river, we finally made our action to Nizal village, our destination. The northern Himalayas were on the southern side for the first time in our lives. We were officially behind the Himalayas, in the land of Apodolpa. The next morning, we took a walk around the village, monasteries, fields, and school. Nizal is a small village. It is the last village in the northernmost part of Dolpa. The yellow mud houses, red, blue, and yellow chortans, few horses in every household, the ancient Kingjir monastery, and the Himalayas to the south gives one an experience of Shangri-La. We reached Nizal during the beginning of summer when all life was slowly growing after a harsh, dead, snow-filled winter. The only vegetations that dominated this region were two thorny shrubs called Karagana and Lonisera, which were brown bare and thorny during this time of the season. However, with passing of days, the bare and hostile plants slowly turned green, blossomed flowers, and eventually reared small red berries called serop in local language. During the berry season, the kids surrounded the plant every time they got a chance. Talking about the school we were there to teach, Sri Yangtze Gumba Basic School was officially established in papers in 1975 AD, some 45 years ago. However, the school took its physical form only in 2011 AD. Different governments and four whole political regimes had changed until it started to function as an educational infrastructure in the region. 
the only state run infrastructure in Nizal Gaon were the police station and the school however the police were stationed in the region only for a half a year and there were no government teachers in the school therefore the school functions solely with support from villagers and volunteer teachers like us The initiation to send volunteer teachers was started by none other than Binod Sahi, the founder of Snow Yak Foundation. We were there just following his footsteps. Besides bureaucracy, the school's infrastructure was minimal, with only one toilet in very poor condition. The school lacked proper child-friendly classrooms, well-managed office space, The classrooms were carried outdoors. Despite the beautiful view with deep blue skies, running classes during the windy and rainy days were very challenging. However, villagers who have a sense of ownership of the school helped build the playground despite the hardship and challenges. Regardless of poor classroom infrastructure, the children had a deep sense of ownership and belongingness to their classrooms. The children wouldn't let other great children enter their classroom. The sense of ownership sometimes took haywire, with kids ending up fighting and crying. This sense of ownership and belongingness of a classroom opened up new doors of perceptions towards the children. This experience touched our hearts like nothing else. We wondered, how would they care if they only had a basic functioning child-friendly classroom like the ones in the government schools of Kathmandu? In context of academics, the children outstood our expectations i was the class teacher of grade 6 due to fewer students in the classroom one could really focus on individual children and their development as a teacher i focused on improving handwriting reading writing and understanding english and nepali along with extra knowledge via national geographic and science videos further I also taught them how to play chess. And use Microsoft Words and other computer applications. And bitto. Look here. Tip. Land kadi bhai? The school also had an eco club which we kept active. The leaders of the eco club were elected democratically amongst the students. We conducted eco classes after school. 
we explained, discussed, and wrote about different topics such as climate change, water cycle, the importance of wildlife, and environmental preservation in the region. The children used to draw water cycle, discuss climate change, deliver speeches about their community, wildlife, and environmental issues during the assembly. Let us hear a short speech by Pema Chering on climate change that he gave during an assembly. In context of our daily routine, we used to go to the water stream every morning. A break cold frozen ice to freshen up. Sometimes we used to go for a run and took time to meditate and be a part of the landscape. The mornings oh, morning, were sir. mostly full of energy to start the assembly. The children would sing the national anthem. Morning prayers. And daily speech. Good evening, Rastar teacher and my dear friends. My name is Tadej Jingme and I am going to talk about our culture of Dolpa. Before starting regular classes. During our leisure time, we visited new places on horsebacks. Or went for a swim during sunny Saturdays. We also attended many puja ceremonies and the monasteries. After school, everyone gathered up to kick start football, in which everyone participated. Many programs were also conducted, such as cultural dance, school march pass,
and awareness programs. Besides school activity, the whole team and local teachers collected data for Arati's thesis. With this work, we got the opportunity to knock on every door and every household in the village. We were greeted everywhere with warm butter tea, chang, arak and dinner. This helped us understand the community more closely. Little had we known that our journey of a lifetime had to come across an unfortunate event. Someone once told me, what if the cure for cancer or AIDS solved the global issue or even take humanity to the stars was lost in one of the millions of children who died due to war, poverty or malnutrition. I think I found the answer in vain. Miss Kavita, if a helicopter can fly to Dolpa, why can't an airplane or a rocket? Miss Kavita, what is it like inside an airplane or a rocket? Miss Kavita, are the sun, stars and the moon living things too? Miss Kavita irritated yet surprised who does. Why would you think so? Because our textbook says living things move. These were the type of questions innocent Prema Dorje, 8 years old, would often wander about. His thoughts and imagination trespassed the bounds of textbooks or something we could imagine. Prema Dorje was a 7-year-old orphan kid who lived in Gefil Gumba and studied in our school in kindergarten. He lost both his parents before he could remember them, yet he was filled with smiles and strange questions. He was one of the best and brightest kids in the school. Despite his grade level, he used to help senior friends of grade 2 and 3 with their homeworks in case they got lazy. Even though Ms. Kavita only trained in grade 3, 4, 5 and 6 for football practices, Dorje was an exceptional case. On our hike to Markham Monastery, Dorje and his few friends from the Gumba followed us. He in his way guided us all the way. Ankitsa, grab this rock and jump. Ankitsa, there is a big statue inside. Come, I'll show you. He grabbed my hand and took me inside. Ankitsa, this is how you bow down in boat region. Now you try. The hike was a very tough hike with steep slopes where you had to climb with your limbs. But the kid would jump from one rock to another like little monkeys. That was the last day I saw Doze filled with life, energy, and enthusiasm. On that day, however, he mentioned a small lump on his throat and that it was a bit uncomfortable for him to eat. The next day, he called off sick and did not attend school. The kids of the Gumba said he had a lump and a fever. After a few days, in one of our visits to the Gumba, we saw Doze. He looked tired and did not talk much. From what I saw, he had a gland due to iron deficiency, which could be cured easily with primary medical treatment. However, this was Upper Dulpa, one of the world's most isolated, remote, poverty-stricken regions in the world. I was concerned and asked his friends to inform the Lamas about the condition. They said he had been under the care of Amzis and prayers to the gods. Even though I did not believe in the prayers, I had a little hope in the local Amjis. We didn't think in an iodine deficiency could take such a fatal turn. But this was Nizal, where people had the least or no faith in modern medicine or relied on herbal or religious treatments. Despite several pledges to call a nurse or to take Doja to the help post in Karangaon, our words and efforts were lost in vain. After two weeks of suffering from the most basic malnutrition, Doje lost his life. Losing Prema Doje, one of, one of the most striking moments among many pleasant and disheartening moments during the entire fellowship.
besides organizational and management issues, one of the major challenges we faced was creating awareness regarding education and health in the community. Despite several awareness programs, speech, and individual counselings with the villagers, creating an impact on awareness was in many ways challenging and frustrating at times. However, after many pleas and requests, we managed to set up a health camp in the school. A nurse from Karang village visited our school. She did thorough checkups of the villagers. Almost half of the village turned out in the school. Setting up the health camp was a pleasing moment to see our efforts deliver some, if not all, solutions to the problem. However, we couldn't fully monitor or evaluate the effects of this event. There might have been chances that people did not follow the medication. Similarly, in context of health, we took our COVID vaccines on top of a mountain in the rain. It was very pleasing to see health workers traveling to such remote places to deliver the vaccine. After finishing up the project and its objectives, we finally decided on a date to return home. During the last few days, we were invited by our students for lunch, dinner and celebration. We were treated with utmost hospitality, good food and best chance. Besides farewell parties and celebrations, we also had to plan the logistic of our return. After a brief SMC meeting, it was decided that the children's parents and their horses would guide and leave us up to Kangla Pass. From there, the rest of the journey across Foxundu Lake up to Kathmandu was up to us. After a couple of cloudy days and snowy days, the sky finally opened up in the morning. We were departing from Nizal. The entire village came to greet us farewell. After a lot of hugs, goodbyes, tears and photo sessions, we left Nizal, aiming to reach safe Foksundu Gumba on the very same day. After nine hours of horse riding across Karang, Saldang, and two 5,000 meter high passes, we reached Shegumba in beach dark at 11 pm. The journey was filled with singing, dancing, jokes, and a hope for better education. It was inspiring to be a part of the hopes and dreams of parents who were sending their children to Kathmandu for a life they never got a chance to live. The next day, at the break of dawn, we headed for Kangla Pass at 3 a.m. in the morning, aiming to reach Foksundo before sunset. On the way, the parents covered their children with blankets and set them on horsebacks and walk along the treacherous rocky path. We were in the middle of the Himalayas, surrounded by massive snow-capped mountains, a crescent moon hanging in the deep blue sky, and the most dazzling sun glittering in the snow-filled landscape. In the snow-covered glittering landscape, the children bid farewell to their parents. Everyone was cheerful, except for Fulbalamo, one of our students who was smiling and exhilarated beyond measures, waved farewell to her cheerful father. When asked if she was feeling sad, she replied, There is no point in crying. I am excited for my future. Purva's father, Sonam Wangdi, 
With tearful eyes held our hands and asked us to take care of her daughter and guide her to the right path. So did all the fathers of the daughters who were crossing the high mountains and rivers with a hope for better education. The next reunion would probably be after five years or more. Fifty-two hundred meter ka high pass or something, mommy. Yes. Tiko, ati garo varde the tera. De. We conquered it. We followed the trials on the foothills of Mount Kanjiroba with this magnificent view along the way. Frozen streams turned to rivers and massive waterfalls. The change in vegetation from tundra, alpine to coniferous forest and no sign of people for hours and hours of our journey was a soulful experience in itself. Not to mention the expression of our students when they saw trees for the very first time enriched our adventure to a whole new level. However, it was innocently funny when they saw chickens in Ringmo village for the very first time as well. The next day, we hiked along trial of Foxundo to reach Ringmo village. The deep blue Foxundo beneath the giant snow-capped mountains was a sight that beguiled us all. The mythological story of how the lake was formed when a powerful Dakini demonic female deity in her rage brought down mountains upon the people of Ringmo who betrayed her when she was being chased by the mighty Padmasambhava, one of the incarnations of Buddha. Kept taking my imagination back when the gods wander around in these mountains. Therefore, it is believed that her curse was so powerful that no life is found in this deep safari colored lake even till date. However, from a scientific point of view, Foxundo Lake is an oligotrophic lake with minimum supply of carbon and nutrition for life to sustain in the environment. <laughs> धेरी बोट मा खोजा मलाई चारी खोट मा खोजा बोट जाने बाटो मुनी भेरी गोट मा खोजा हिम्फे दिको आ धेरी मा भिम्फे दिको पा धेरी मा कैले से तै बोके फुल छो है तिये को सुखा भंदा हो and once again, it was a sight when the kids saw a jeep for the very first time in their lives. To our dismay, the next morning, we could not get the seat for our flight book home. The flights were all packed for the next couple of days due to the increase of flow of local tourists. So we decided to take proper rest after the physically demanding trek and see around Jufal until we could find a seat back home. Finally, after proper rest and wandering around Jufal and its apple fields, we got our share of apples, local beans, lots of stories and the flight back home for Dipavali, the Hindu festival of light. Come on, 
Kost nog wat. En de keel. The children were mesmerized to see Kathmandu during our landing at night time. One of the expressions I would say with me dearly is when Chiring Lamo, one of our students, exhilarated and eyes wide open said. <laughs> Kathmandu looks like night sky filled with bright colorful stars. Thus, we were finally home after a milestone experience of our lives. With expectation to bring out change, this journey has changed me instead. Experiencing Dolpa, its culture, people, lifestyle and geography helped me discover a humbleness within myself. However, only after a struggle, not just with the eccentric components, but the eccentric elements of self, helped me uncover the sense of humility. Thus, as expressed by Herman Heise, the bird is struggling out of the egg. The egg is the world. Whoever wants to be born must first destroy a world. The bird is flying to the god. Or, in other words, he who wants to be born will have to destroy a world and listen to the truths that his blood murmurs within himself. Thank you.